Book Two. A Hero's Son Awakens. When primal dawn spread on the eastern sky her fingers of pink light, Odysseus's true son stood up, drew on his tunic and his mantle, slung on a sword belt and a new-edged sword, tied his smooth feet into good rawhide sandals, and left his room. A god's brilliance upon him. He found the criers with clarion voices and told them to muster the unshorn Achaeans in full assembly. The call sang out, and the men came streaming in. And when they filled the assembly ground, he entered, spear in hand, with two quick hounds at heel. Athena lavished on him a sunlit grace that held the eye of the multitude. Old men made way for him as he took his father's chair. Now Lord Egyptius, bent down and sage with years, opened the assembly. This man's son had served under the great Odysseus, gone in the decked ships with him to the wild horse country of Troy, a spearman, Antiphus by name. The ravenous cyclops in the cave destroyed him last in his feast of men. Three other sons the old man had, and one, Eurynomus, went with the suitors. Two farmed for their father. But even so, the old man pined, remembering the absent one, and a tear welled up as he spoke. Hear me, Ithacans, Hear what I have to say. No meeting has been held here since our king Odysseus left port in the decked ships. Who finds occasion for assembly now? One of the young men? One of the older lot? Has he had word our fighters are returning? News to report if he got wind of it? Or is it something else touching the realm? The man has vigor, I should say. More power to him. Whatever he desires, may Zeus fulfill it. The old man's words delighted the son of Odysseus, who kept his chair no longer but stood up, eager to speak in the midst of all the men. The crier Piscina, master of debate, brought him the staff and placed it in his hand. Then the boy touched the old man's shoulder and said, No need to wonder any more, sir, who called this session. The distress is mine. As to our troops returning, I have no news, news to report if I got wind of it, nor have I public business to propose. Only my need and the trouble of my house, the troubles. My distinguished father is lost, who ruled among you once, mild as a father, and there is now this greater evil still. My home and all I have are being ruined. Mother wanted no suitors, but like a pack they came, sons of the best men here among them, lads with no stomach for an introduction to Icarius, her father across the sea. He would require a wedding gift and give her to someone who found favor in her eyes. No, these men spend their days around our house, killing our beeves and sheep and fatted goats, carousing, soaking up our good dark wine, not caring what they do. They squander everything. We have no strong Odysseus to defend us. And as to putting up a fight ourselves, we'd only show our incompetence in arms. Expel them, yes, if I only had the power. The whole thing's out of hand, insufferable. My house is being plundered. Is this courtesy? Where is your indignation? Where is your shame? Think of the talk in the islands all around us and fear the wrath of the gods, or they may turn and send you some devilry. Friends, by Olympian Zeus and holy justice that holds men in assembly and sets them free, make an end of this. Let me lament in peace my private loss. Or did my father Odysseus ever do injury to the armed Achaeans? Is this your way of taking it out on me, giving free rein to these young men? I might as well, might better, see my treasure and livestock taken over by you all. Then, if you fed on them, I'd have some remedy. And when we met in public in the town, I'd press my claim. You might make restitution. This way you hurt me when my hands are tied. And in hot anger now, he threw the staff to the ground, his eyes grown bright with tears. A wave of sympathy ran through the crowd, all hushed and no one there had the audacity to answer harshly, except Antinous, who said, What high and mighty talk, Telemachus, no holding you. You want to shame us and humiliate us, but you should know the suitors are not to blame. It is your own dear, incomparably cunning mother. For three years now, and it will soon be four, she has been breaking the hearts of the Achaeans, holding out hope to all and sending promises to each man privately, but thinking otherwise. Here is an instance of her trickery. She had her great loom standing in the hall and the fine warp of some vast fabric on it. We were attending her, and she said to us, Young men, my suitors, now my lord is dead, 
Let me finish my weaving before I marry, or else my thread will have been spun in vain. It is a shroud I weave for Lord Laertes when cold death comes to lay him on his bier. The country wives would hold me in dishonour if he with all his fortune lay unshrouded. We have men's hearts. She touched them. We agreed. So every day she wove on the great loom, but every night by torchlight she unwove it. And so for three years she deceived the Achaeans. But when the seasons brought the fourth around, one of her maids who knew the secret told us. We found her unravelling the splendid shroud. She had to finish then, although she hated it. Now here is the suitor's answer. You and all the Achaeans mark it well. Dismiss your mother from the house, or make her marry the man her father names and she prefers. Does she intend to keep us dangling forever? She may rely too long on Athena's gifts, talent in handicraft and a clever mind so cunning. History cannot show the like among the ringleted ladies of Achaea. Mycenae with her coronet, Alcmene, Tyro. Wits like Penelope's never were before, but this time, well, she made poor use of them. For here are suitors eating up your property as long as she holds out, a plan some god put in her mind. She makes a name for herself, but you can feel the loss it means for you. Our own affairs can wait. We'll never go anywhere else until she takes an Achaean to her liking. But clear-headed Telemachus replied, Antinous, can I banish against her will the mother who bore me and took care of me? My father is either dead or far away. But dearly I should pay for this at Icarus's hands if ever I sent her back. The powers of darkness would requite it too. My mother's parting curse would call hell's furies to punish me, along with the scorn of men. No, I can never give the word for this. But if your hearts are capable of shame, leave my great hall and take your dinner elsewhere. Consume your own stores. Turn and turn about. Use one another's houses. If you choose to slaughter one man's livestock and pay nothing, this is rapine, and by the eternal gods, I beg Zeus, you shall get what you deserve. A slaughter here and nothing paid for it. Now Zeus, who views the wide world, sent a sign to him, launching a pair of eagles from a mountain crest in gliding flight down the soft blowing wind, wingtip to wingtip, quivering taut, companions, till high above the assembly of many voices they wheeled their dense wings beating, and in havoc dropped on the heads of the crowd a deathly omen, wielding their talons, tearing cheeks and throats, then veered away on the right hand through the city. Astonished, gaping after the birds, the men felt their hearts flood, foreboding things to come. And now they heard the old lord Halitherses, son of Mastor, keenest among the old at reading bird flight into accurate speech. In his anxiety for them, he rose and said, Hear me, Ithacans, hear what I have to say, and may I hope to open the suitor's eyes to the black wave towering over them. Odysseus will not be absent from his family long. He is already near, carrying in him a bloody doom for all these men, and sorrow for many more on our high sea-mark Ithaca. Let us think how to stop it. Let the suitors drop their suit. They had better, without delay. I am old enough to know a sign when I see one, and I say all has come to pass for Odysseus, as I foretold when the Argives massed on Troy, and he, the great tactician, joined the rest. My forecast was that after nineteen years, many blows weathered, all his shipmates lost, himself unrecognized by anyone, he would come home. I see this all fulfilled. But Polybus's son, Eurymachus, retorted, Old man, go tell the omens for your children at home and try to keep them out of trouble. I am more fit to interpret this than you are. Bird life plenty is found in the sunny air, not all of it significant. As for Odysseus, he perished far from home. You should have perished with him. Then we'd be spared this nonsense in assembly, as good as telling Telemachus to rage on. Do you think you can gamble on a gift from him? Here is what I foretell, and it's quite certain. If you, with what you know of ancient law, encourage bitterness in this young man, it means for him only the more frustration. He can do nothing whatever with two eagles. And as for you, old man, we'll fix a penalty that you will groan to pay. Before the whole assembly, I advise Telemachus to send his mother to her father's house. Let them arrange her wedding there, and fix a portion suitable for a valued daughter. 
Until he does this, courtship is our business. Vexing though it may be, we fear no one, certainly not Telemachus with his talk. And we care nothing for your divining, uncle. Useless talk. You win more hatred by it. We'll share his meat, no thanks or fee to him, as long as she delays and maddens us. It is a long, long time we have been waiting in rivalry for this beauty. We could have gone elsewhere and found ourselves very decent wives. Clear-headed Telemachus replied to this. Eurymachus and noble suitors all, I am finished with appeals and argument. The gods know and the Achaeans know these things. But give me a fast ship and a crew of twenty who will see me through a voyage out and back. I'll go to Sandy Pylos, then to Sparta, for news of father since he sailed from Troy. Some traveller's tale, perhaps, or rumoured fame issued from Zeus himself into the world. If he is alive and beating his way home, I might hold out for another weary year. But if they tell me that he's dead and gone, then I can come back to my own dear country and raise a mound for him, and burn his gear with all the funeral honours that befit him, and give my mother to another husband. The boy sat down in silence. Next to stand was Mentor, comrade-in-arms of the Prince Odysseus, an old man now. Odysseus left him authority over his house and slaves to guard them well. In his concern he spoke to the assembly. Hear me, Ithacans, hear what I have to say. Let no man holding scepter as a king be thoughtful, mild, kindly, or virtuous. Let him be cruel and practice evil ways. It is so clear that no one here remembers how like a gentle father Odysseus ruled you. I find it less revolting that the suitors carry their malice into violent acts. At least they stake their lives when they go pillaging the house of Odysseus. Their lives upon it, he will not come again. What sickens me is to see the whole community sitting still and never a voice or a hand raised against them. A mere handful compared with you. Leocritus, Euena's son, replied to him, Mentor, what mischief are you raking up? Will this crowd risk the sword's edge over a dinner? Suppose Odysseus himself indeed came in and found the suitors at his table. He might be hot to drive them out. What then? Never would he enjoy his wife again, the wife who loves him well. He'd only bring down abject death on himself against those odds. Madness to talk of fighting in either case. Now let all present go about their business. Halitherses and Mentor will speed the traveller, they can help him. They were his father's friends. I rather think he will be sitting here a long time yet, waiting for news on Ithaca. That seafaring he spoke of is beyond him. On this note, they were quick to end their parley. The assembly broke up, everyone went home. The suitors home to Odysseus's house again. But Telemachus walked down along the shore and washed his hands in the foam of the grey sea. Then said this prayer, O oh God of yesterday, guest in our house who told me to take ship on the hazy sea for news of my lost father, listen to me, be near me. The Achaeans only wait or hope to hinder me, the damned insolent suitors most of all. Athena was nearby and came to him, putting on Mentor's figure and his tone, the warm voice in a lucid flight of words. You'll never be faint-hearted or a fool, Telemachus, if you have your father's spirit. He finished what he cared to say, and what he took in hand he brought to pass. The sea roots will yield their distances to his true son, Penelope's true son. I doubt another's luck would hold so far. The son is rare who measures with his father, and one in a thousand is a better man, but you will have the sap and wit and prudence, for you get that from Odysseus to give you a fair chance of winning through. So never mind the suitors and their ways. There is no judgment in them. Neither do they know anything of death and the black terror close upon them. Doomsday on them all. You need not linger over going to sea. I sailed beside your father in the old days. I'll find a ship for you and help you sail her. So go on home, as if to join the suitors, but get provisions ready in containers. Wine in two-handled jugs and barley meal, the staying power of oarsmen, in skin bags, watertight. I'll go the rounds and call a crew of volunteers together. Hundreds of ships are beached on sea-girt Ithaca. Let me but choose the soundest, old or new. We'll rig her and take her out on the broad sea. This was the divine speech Telemachus heard from Athena, Zeus's daughter. He stayed no longer. 
but took his heartache home and found the robust suitors there at work, skinning goats and roasting pigs in the courtyard. Antinous came straight over, laughing at him, and took him by the hand with a bold greeting. High-handed Telemachus, control your temper. Come on, get over it. No more grim thoughts, but feast and drink with me the way you used to. The Achaeans will attend to all you ask for, ship, crew, and crossing to the holy land of Pylos for the news about your father. Telemachus replied with no confusion. Antinous, I cannot see myself again taking a quiet dinner in this company. Isn't it enough that you could strip my house under my very nose when I was young? Now that I know, being grown, what others say, I understand it all, and my heart is full. I'll bring black doom upon you if I can, either in Pylos if I go, or in this country. And I will go, go all the way, if only as someone's passenger. I have no ship, no oarsman, and it suits you that I have none. Calmly he drew his hand from Antinous's hand. At this the suitors, while they dressed their meat, began to exchange loud mocking talk about him. One young, top-lofty gallant set the tone. Well, think of that. Telemachus has a mind to murder us. He's going to lead Avengers out of Pylos, or Sparta, maybe. Oh, he's wild to do it. Or else he'll try the fat land of Ephyra. He can get poison there and bring it home, dock to the wine jar and dispatch us all. Another took the cue. Well, now, who knows? He might be lost at sea, just like Odysseus, knocking around in a ship far from his friends. And what a lot of trouble that would give us making the right division of his things. We'd keep his house as dowry for his mother, his mother and the man who marries her. That was the drift of it. Telemachus went on through to the storeroom of his father, a great vault where gold and bronze lay piled along with chests of clothes and fragrant oil, and there were jars of earthenware in rows, holding an old wine, mellow, unmixed and rare. Cool stood the jars against the wall kept for whatever day Odysseus, worn by hardships, might come home. The double folding doors were tightly locked and guarded night and day by the serving woman Eurycleia, granddaughter of Pisino, in all her duty vigilant and shrewd. Telemachus called her to the storeroom, saying, Nurse, get a few two-handled travelling jugs filled up with wine. The second best, not that you keep for your unlucky lord and king, hoping he may have slipped away from death and may yet come again, royal Odysseus. Twelve amphorae I will do. Seal them up tight, and pour out barley into leather bags. Twenty bushels of barley meal ground fine. Now keep this to yourself. Collect these things, and after dark, when mother has retired and gone upstairs to bed, I'll come for them. I sail to Sandy Pylos, then to Sparta, to see what news there is of father's voyage. His loving nurse, Eurycleia, gave a cry, and tears sprang to her eyes as she wailed softly. Dear child! Whatever put this in your head? Why do you want to go so far in the world, and you our only darling? Lord Odysseus died in some strange place far from his homeland. Think how when you have turned your back, these men will plot to kill you and share all your things. Stay with your own, dear, do. Why should you suffer hardship and homelessness on the wild sea? But seeing all clear, Telemachus replied, Take heart, nurse. There's a god behind this plan, and you must swear to keep it from my mother until the eleventh day or twelfth, or till she misses me, or hears that I'm gone. She must not tear her lovely skin lamenting. So the old woman vowed by all the gods and vowed again to carry out his wishes. Then she filled up the amphorae with wine and sifted barley meal into leather bags. Telemachus rejoined the suitors. Meanwhile, the goddess with grey eyes had other business. Disguised as Telemachus, she roamed the town, taking each likely man aside and telling him, Meet us at nightfall at the ship. Indeed, she asked Noemon, Phronius's wealthy son, to lend her a fast ship, and he complied. Now when at sundown shadows crossed the lanes, she dragged the cutter to the sea and launched it, fitted out with tough sea-going gear, and tied it up away at the harbour's edge. The crewmen gathered, sent there by the goddess. Then it occurred to the grey-eyed goddess Athena to pass inside the house of the hero Odysseus, showering a sweet drowsiness on the suitors, whom she had presently wandering in their wine. And soon, as they could hold their cups no longer, they straggled off to find their beds in town, eyes heavy-lidded, laden down with sleep. 
Then to Telemachus the grey-eyed goddess appeared again with Mentor's form and voice, calling him out of the lofty emptied hall. Telemachus, your crew of fighting men is ready at the oars and waiting for you. Come on, no point in holding up the sailing. And Pallas Athena turned like the wind, running ahead of him. He followed in her footsteps down to the seaside, where they found the ship and oarsmen with flowing hair at the water's edge. Telemachus, now strong in the magic, cried, Come with me, friends, and get our rations down. They are all packed at home, and my own mother knows nothing. Only one maid was told. He turned and led the way, and they came after, carried and stowed all in the well-trimmed ship, as the dear son of Odysseus commanded. Telemachus then stepped aboard. Athena took her position aft, and he sat by her. The two stroke oars cast off the stern hawsers and vaulted over the gunnels to their benches. Grey-eyed Athena stirred them a following wind, soughing from the northwest on the wine-dark sea, and as he felt the wind, Telemachus called to all hands to break out mast and sail. They pushed the fur mast high and stepped it firm amidships in the box, made fast the forestays, then hoisted up the white sail on its halyards until the wind caught booming in the sail, and a flushing wave sang backward from the bow on either side as the ship got way upon her, holding her steady course. Now they made all secure in the fast black ship, and setting out the wine bowls all abrim, they made libation to the gods, the undying, the ever new, most of all to the grey-eyed daughter of Zeus, and the prow sheered through the night into the dawn.